it's called. Anybody guess it? Trending Hashtag trending now. Ah! And in the next few weeks, we're going to be covering some of the most popular hashtags that are currently roaming the Twitterverse, including hashtag no filter. Anybody ever do hashtag no filter when you're doing your little selfie and you're like, That's a nice one, right? That was a beautiful one, right? Then we're going to be doing hashtag, what's the next one, Dylan? Relationship goals. Hashtag relationship goals. See, that's the kind of stuff that all y'all, when you see pictures of me and Becca, you're like, hashtag relationship goals all day, all day, all day, all day, all day. We're going to be, all day, all day. Hashtag sorry, not sorry. Anybody ever do that one? <laughs> All the time. I, you're like sorry, not sorry in person right here. That's right. And then, of course, hashtag blessed, yo, because I'm just hashtag blessed, yo. So hashtag trending now. Who has their Bibles? Let me see them. Hold them over there. Say word. I don't care if it's your phone, your iPad. You got your actual Bible in your hand. If you have a Bible here in this place, wave it at me. Say word. We're going to be reading from the Bible in the book of John chapter 4 in just a few minutes. And we're kicking off this series with a message called Hashtag No Filter. We're going to be talking about being real in a fake world. Listen, we all put up filters, right? Would you guys agree with me? We put up filters. We put on masks. We try to hide who we really are and show everyone else in the world what we think they want to see. You ever notice that about yourself or other people and I mean this is this is the thing about being always tied to social media is that people only put on social media what they want you to see did you know that unless of course they're in one of their like subtweeting modes and they just want to talk trash about people all night for the most part what people put on social media is only the stuff they want you to see the best the brightest the happiest the the goodest times that they have right which the beach hashtag blessed you right me and my boo hashtag relationship goals yo right by by the way if you are in a relationship and you take a picture of yourself with the relationship that you are in, you don't put hashtag relationship goals because other people just look at that and they're like, yeah, no. That, no, no, no. It, other people comment on, on your photo, hashtag relationship goals, right, Mr. Dylan? Or, or perhaps with a bag of Doritos, like I would put that up and be like hashtag relationship goals because if somebody said it to you, that's cool, but you don't say it about yourself. So you say, hashtag somebody said, hashtag about me, hashtag relationship goals. There you go. That's how you do it. That avoids the awkwardness and the weirdness and the silliness. Uh, but, but, th but, you gotta, but then you got to be like that guy that has like 98 hashtags to his Instagram post because he's just trying to get as many followers as possible. Dude. Hashtag your, hashtag mom, hashtag went, hashtag to, hashtag college. Um, <laughs> Listen, we're talking about filters, right? And I thought it'd be fun to, to kick it off this way. Uh, well, you guys, look, I, I, took, I took some photos and, and selfies, right? Because like, I'm like the selfie king. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you, when this photo comes up, to tell me if you think there is a filter on it or not. And as a bonus point, what type of filter you think it might be? Go ahead and throw up the first one. Is there a filter on there? Yes. What is it? No. It's a puppy. What happens if I open my mouth? The tongue comes out. It's so awesome. He's like, ha, 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 ha. It's a, it, dude, it makes a creepy noise. All right, throw me up the next one. Is there a filter on that? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. What is it? Mona Lisa, because, you know, like I'm like a work of art, you know. Okay, next one. Throw it up there. Is there a filter on that? No, there's no filter on that? That's just me, pure and simple? What is it? Is it a face swap? Is it a face swap? And if so, I'll give a million points if you can tell me who the face swap is with. Who is it? Dylan Scott wearing a mask, everybody. Ooh, that was a hard one. Although I do look pretty good with, like, the, the facial hair going on. 
I can't grow facial hair like that because I just don't have as much testosterone as Dylan. Isn't that sad? Um, go and throw up the next one. Let's see that one. Is there a filter on that? You guys are so smart. Dang. Although I think I saw that guy at McDonald's uh, eating the all-you-can-eat french fries. Did you guys hear about all-you-can-eat french fries at McDonald's now? What the heck? No, no joke. McDonald's announced that they are going to be having all-you-can-eat french fries because we don't have enough fried salty starch in our diets. <laughs> That's not good. That's not good. Throw up the next one. Throw up the next one. Ooh, ooh. I will give one million points if you can tell me who that is. Nope. It's a face swap. It is. Who is it? Who is it? Nope. Who is it? Sam Kandargi. Media guy extraordinaire in the back. Sam's in the back. Wave to everybody, Sam. He's back there running the computer. He's actually the one putting these photos up right now. Throw me up the next one. Is there a filter on that? What is that? It's a zebra face. Give me the next one. Is there a filter on that? $100 bills, y'all. All day. All day. $100 bills. Anybody ever actually have $100 bills in their wallet? That's, that is awesome. If, if, if there's this many people walking around with $100 bills in their wallet, I want to know why our speed of light giving is not more. That's... I just want to throw that out there. Just want to throw that out there. Throw out the next one. What do we got? Ooh. Who is that? Pastor Jason face swap. That's a pretty good one. Don't you guys think? Look how awesome that looks. Dang. That's amazing. Where is Pastor Jason? Pastor Jason, that's a hot one right there. That's a hot one. That's a hot one right there. Hot. Hot. Throw me up the next one. Ooh. Yeah. Cheetah girl face or cheetah Pastor Steve face or something like that. Give me the next one. That's the other guy sitting next to the guy eating the all-you-can-eat fries. They're sitting across the table from each other in case you were wondering. Those are the two French fry buddies. Next one. This is, this is actually my favorite new filter on Snapchat because it's just hilarious to me. I think it's, why? Uh, because I'm awesome. That's why. Next one. Is there a filter on that one? Or is that real life? <laughs> that, would be, that would be real weird. Y'all would be like, mom and dad, we got to talk about Pastor Steve. He got issues. Um, throw me up the next one. Is there a filter on that one? No, there's not. I actually was crying and my mascara ran and it was a sad, sad day. Give me the next one. Give me the next one. Is there a filter on that one? You are so mean. That's an old man filter. That's actually a fun one because it makes you look old. And we took a picture of my niece with this filter, and I showed it to my boys, and I said, who's that? And they're all, Grandma. And I was all, oh. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Next one. Throw it up there. Oh, who's that? Who can tell me? Oh, Pastor Becca. You can tell because the bangs coming through the forehead. It's like you have really bushy eyebrows. It's kind of funny. Next one. Is there a filter on that one? What? No, I'm really that good looking. Look at, look at my flawless complexion, my spectacularly good looking amazingness. That's like, that gives me butterflies to look at. Like I look at that and I'm like, dang, dang, I want to hang out with him. All right, all right. <laughs> What's that? Give you one that has no filter. All right, ready? Here it is. Pretty, so pretty, right? Listen, so often in life, people only show what they want other people to see. It cracks me up. You ever seen those things? Uh, 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 I've seen them on um, 
I've actually seen them on some Snapchat stuff. I've seen them on t some Tumblr stuff where people are like, hashtag no filter, and other people are like, seriously? Like, you can see where you have completely tweaked this photo, you ridiculous human being, you. And, and, and people are only trying to show the world what they want them to see. I, I, I've been through a whole lot of phases in my life, you guys, and, 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 and I'm going to be 100% honest that, that even now I'm still trying to not only discover who I am but be true to who I am because so often we, 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 we feel like we have to put on a face and put on a front and try to pretend to be something that we think other people want us to be. Look, just last week, Pastor Jason was telling you, right, that we were at this huge meeting of pastors. There was like almost 1,200 pastors all together in this place, and we were doing like voting and a whole bunch of other stuff. And in that was, was, was like 350 youth pastors that were part of this. And, and we went to a brunch where our church was honored for our Speed the Light giving. He told you, right, we're number two in our whole district. 450 churches. We were the second place in, in our whole district. But when, when we're there, who's first? It's another church like up in Northern California. Can I tell you a secret though? The only reason they beat us is because they have a matching donor at their church. So whatever their students raise, this person matches every year. Had they not had that or had we had that, we would have beat them. So here you, here's what you got to do. I want all y'all to start talking to your rich aunts and uncles and be like, hey, will you be a matching donor for our Speed the Light <laughs> missions <laughs> fundraising? Right, Jason? Right? Yeah? Come on, man. We need it. It's all for missions. But listen, I have tried for a long time, I, and I still find myself doing this. I'm in this place with all these pastors, and, and, and I'm going to be honest, you guys, pastors for the most part, they are stuffy. They are like oh, very proper. And yes, I, right, Jason? Like, don't you kind of feel out of place when you're in there? For the most part, like a lot of these guys are in suits and they're looking at us like, oh, what are you doing here? <laughs> right? And I'm walking in my shorts. I'm like, hey, guys. Ah. <laughs> I actually had one guy pull me aside and was like, bro, what are you wearing? I was like literally wearing like this, right? Like I was wearing shorts, my T-shirt. He's like, bro, what are you wearing? I can't believe you're actually wearing that here. And I was like, for real? And I look at him and I'm like, dude, you are wearing skinny jeans and boots and like a deep V. And you're getting on me for my shorts and t-shirt. Get out of here. When you got a V that like, it, you go like, you just pull it and your belly button pops out, you know your V is too deep, right? I'm just saying. Skinny jeans only work on, what's the first word of that? Skinny people. Okay, so, this, and he is not skinny. Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't wear skinny jeans for a reason. Because I don't want to look like I got sausages. Like, I'm like. <laughs> what the heck, man? Okay, so listen, we all, we all try to do this. I, I remember when I was like 14, I went through a thug phase, okay? A no joke, right? Like, I, I thought. I was thugging it, and, and I got in a lot of fights, and I made a lot of bad choices, but I'm going to tell you right now, I put on this front, right, and, and, and at this point in my life, at this time in, in the history of my life, I, um, I had a, an incredibly expansive vocabulary that was made up of like two words, and one of those words is this magic word, it's called the F-bomb, and I learned how to use it as like a noun, a verb, an adjective, an adverb, an <laughs> I, it's like, it was like this magic word for me that was everything. And I remember, th I, I think back on some of my conversations with some of my friends at that point in history in my life, and I'm like, man, people listening to our conversations had to think that we were absolute and utter fools, right? I mean, you can only use the same word so many times in one sentence before it's like, what are you even saying? Man, those F and F's with their F and F and F and F and F. F them, man. F and F's. Mother effers. You know what I'm saying. Don't even try to be the judgy face right now, right? You've heard it or you've done it in this room. I know. I know. You haven't heard it? Don't even try to play that, Jordan. I know you, man. Jordan, I've heard your comedy routine. Don't even try to play that, my friend. 
<laughs> All right. So listen, then there was a phase in my life that I decided that I wanted to party, okay? Um, I would go with my friends, and I would get wasted and be stupid, and there was, there was, I remember the worst night of my life, a buddy of mine and I went to a bar that we knew didn't card, and we, no joke between us, each polished off like nine Coronas, we had like four double shots of Jack, I mean, I'm talking like, this was the, this was, I, I remember, I can't, I, I remember everything about the night, and yet at the same time, I, all I remember was I felt like I was going to die. So at about two in the morning when we realized we better go home, I'm like, well, we can't go like this, so let's go try to sober up. So we went to another place that we knew had all you could eat, pancakes and coffee for $1.99. IHOP. No, it's not IHOP, man. This is Vegas. This is one of like the old, like, funky, stanky casinos that when you walk in smells like people have been smoking there since 1940 because they have. Okay, like just the thick cloud of smoke and butt in the room. Okay, so so I walk, we walk in there, and 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 I drink like twelve cups of coffee to try to sober up, eat a plate of pancakes, and I go home. My mom's waiting up for me. By this point, it's four thirty in the morning, and she's like, "What? What? What kept you? Are you okay? You didn't call?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, mom, I'm totally great." She's like, "Are you sure?" I'm like, "Yeah." And so. I, I think now, looking back on it, she knew exactly what was going on because she's smart, right? But she's like, all right, go ahead and go to bed. So I lay down in bed, right? And I remember just feeling like I was going to die because I still had, like, the, the crazy alcohol buzz going on and, 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 and all the, the weird downer of that. But at the same time, I had one of the most intense caffeine highs I've ever had where it felt like my brain was vibrating. So... I don't know if you can imagine mixing the feeling of like being completely drugged and like you want to pass out with the feeling of being like you're electrocuted in one moment. And I laid in my bed like this. Just sweating for like five hours before I finally like I think I sobered up enough or, or the caffeine kicked out enough that I felt like I wasn't going to die anymore. Listen. So many of us, you guys, it's filters. It's filters all around. It's, we, we, we try to be things we're not. We try to show things we're not. We try to do things that we don't want to do because we think other people want us to do them. And, and it's stupid. I'm going to tell, tell you right now it's stupid. It was stupid that I did that. It was stupid that I made those choices. It was stupid that I got in the fights. It was stupid that I used the F-bomb for every other word. It was stupid that I did these things because that wasn't me. It wasn't me. And it took a long time for me to figure out what me was, who me was, not the me that this person wanted me to be or that I thought that person wanted me to be or who I thought this person wanted me to show or that person wanted me to, 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 to pretend to be all around. But I had to figure out who me is and then actually learn to be me. Hashtag no filter. How can we begin to strip away the filters? How'd you turn to... John chapter 9 here, or sorry, John chapter 4 here just a couple minutes ago. I want to start reading there now, and this is honestly, you guys, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite stories in the Bible. This is about a woman who Jesus meets at a well, and there's so much tied into this story that is under the surface, things that we would not get just reading through it as we go through it. And I'm going to try to pull out as much as I can as we go through this. So John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, says this. Jesus knew that the Pharisees had heard he was baptizing and making more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Okay, real, real quick pause. So the Pharisees are just getting ticked at Jesus. They don't like Jesus. They don't like what he's doing. They don't like what he stands for. And Let's be honest, Jesus is, is just prodding them a little bit and poking them a little bit to the point where, in some other stories, there are Pharisees coming up to him being like, do you know that you offend us when you say these things? He's like, yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> so he, he, he actually leaves because they're getting so angry at him and they're, they're getting so just, just full of hatred for him and he knew it wasn't his time. So he decides it's time to leave this area and go somewhere else. 
and he returns to Galilee. So he had to go to Samaria on the way. Now, real quick, Samaria, you guys. I know that this is not in this story, but what you need to understand about Samaria is Samaria was hated. They were despised. They were disgusting. They were vile. Jews and Samaritans did not hang out together. They didn't talk. They didn't interact. Because to Jews, Samaritans were disgusting half-breeds. See, what happened was this. In the, in the Old Testament, the, 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 the people of God, the Israelites, split into two kingdoms. And the one kingdom that became Samaria, the other kingdom that stayed Israel, the one kingdom that became Samaria, they began to, to, to intermingle with all the peoples around them. And they began to have kids, and, 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 and they had kids, and so on. And so they weren't the, the, the Jewish race anymore. And I know that, that, that things shouldn't be about race, but... For these people, at this time in history, it was about race, and it was about keeping the race pure, right? And so not only that, but they began to worship other gods, and, and they began to offer sacrifices to other gods. And, and so the, the, the pure Jews, the Jews that had kept themselves pure and, and worshiped God and kept their worship true and, and done what they, were, they thought they were supposed to do, they despised the Samaritans. They thought they were vile and disgusting, filthy half-breeds, right? Like, any Harry Potter fans in here? Yeah. They were filthy mudbloods. That's what they were, those Samaritans, all right? They hated them. Now, in Harry Potter, does everybody hate the mudbloods? No, because they're just muggles, right? So, but there are those who were the pure bloods who they were, they, 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 they held on to the pure blood and they were like, oh, we got to be the pure blood and we got we to hold on to the pure blood. And, and, and this is what some of these people really and truly thought. So much so that even the people that weren't really like strong opinion either way, they would avoid Samaritans just to avoid the controversy of having conversations with them and having to try to explain to some of these really, really like stern types, oh, why were you talking to a Samaritan? <laughs> so, eventually he comes to the Samaritan village of Sikar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well at about noontime. Soon, a Samaritan woman came out to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. Again, I want to I wanna just begin to draw out some of the things that are happening here. So this is a Samaritan, right? in Samaria, and Jesus is a pure-blood Jew. So there's already some social norms that Jesus is crossing the boundaries and the barriers of. I just want to point that out. Beyond that, this is a woman. And in this time in history, a man did not pay a woman any mind. He did not listen to what she had to say. He did not care what she had to say. Because at this point, in this place, in this time in history, women were baby factories. And that's about it. And so not only does Jesus break the social norm of speaking to a filthy half-breed, a mudblood, but he speaks to a woman in public, in broad daylight. Scandalous! Hashtag scandalous. Oh my gosh, did you see Jesus? He was talking to that woman down by the well, and she was a Samaritan. She, oh my God, did you see that? Did, can you believe Jesus doing that? You got, all the gossips were going nuts that day. So Jesus was alone at the time because the disciples had gone on to the village to buy some food for lunch. The woman was surprised. Because just like I just said, Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. And she said to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. Why are you asking me for a drink? I want to pause right here. Begin to draw out what I want you to remember tonight. We're asking the question, how can we begin to strip away the filters? And I want to do this from the standpoint of this woman at the well and the journey that she goes through in this conversation with Jesus. The first thing for every single one of us needs to be this. Come to the well. Say, come to the well. Say, come to the well. Because this is simply beginning to recognize and understand that there is a need. There is an innate desire of something more that we, we, we need this. 
So for this woman, go ahead and throw that slide up, Sam, if you don't mind. For this woman, she knew that she was thirsty. She knew that she had a physical need, and she knew that this need needed to be met. So she went to the well. Now, she did not know what she was going to find there, but she knew that she needed something. For every single one of us, there's different reasons that maybe you're here today. Maybe your friend invited you. Maybe you saw this place when you were driving by and you, you, you felt drawn up here. Maybe you saw something online. Maybe you, you met Pastor Jason at a game and he was like, hey, you should totally come to our youth group. This is totally cool. Ah, because Pastor Jason invites everybody and he's super awesome like that. But however you ended up here, maybe there was something that you knew that you needed that you didn't even know that you needed. Because the fact of the matter is this, we are thirsty. Say thirsty. And there is a, a, a need in all of us that many of us don't even know that we need, but all we know is that there's something that we cannot quench. No matter what we do, no matter where we go, no matter what we try to fill our time with, our energy with, no matter how often we try to do things or where we try to go or how much alcohol we consume or, 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 or how many video games we play or how many times we go out with our friends or no matter what we do in this life, we cannot quench this thirst. We cannot fill this, this, this gaping chasm within us. All we know is that something is missing, that there is a physical spiritual, emotional need that is not being met. And this is what this woman is there for. She is coming to the well because there is a thirst, because there is a desire for something, and she doesn't even know what she's there for. For you here in this place, I would say the same of you. You've come to this place, and I'm going to call this the well. You've come to the well, and you don't even know why you're here. All you know is maybe you get free pizza or some, like, cinnamon roll, Princess Leia bun things or some hands Rolos or whatever it is that you, you think that you're here for. But the fact is you are here for more. You are here for more than you can begin to imagine because it is only here in the presence of God that you will find what you've been looking for. It is only here among his people, among those that are seeking him, that you will find the only thing that can quench your thirst. Come to the well and drink the water. So this woman is simply responding to a physical need, but we are all drawn by a deeper need. This is outlined for us throughout the word of God, all the way back into the Old Testament. I just pulled out a couple of psalms because I love how the psalms words it in, in, in these amazing poetic manners. Psalm 42, beginning in verse 1, says this, As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go and stand before him? Psalm 63, verse 1 says this, O God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. Now, we should know that feeling better than a lot of people in our nation, right? Because you talk about that idea of a parched and weary land where there is no water. Today, it's like starting to peak up above that 90-degree mark, right? This is the point where we all get in our cars in the afternoon, and we're like, why the hell do I live here again? <laughs> now, for you guys, you guys are young, and you're like, it's because my mom and dad made me live here. Dang it. Soon as I'm 18, I'm out of here. I'm going to college in SoCal, in the Midwest, on the East Coast. I'm going anywhere but Vegas. How many of you guys are saying that right now? Can I tell you a secret? Can I tell you a secret? You say that, and you'll do that, and then you'll be back here. Because here's what happens. You move anywhere else in the nation, and you realize that you've been spoiled because everything here is open 24 hours, seven days a week. And you go anywhere else, and everything closes at 7. And all of a sudden, when you're at college in Ohio, and you want a taco at 8.30 at night, you're like, there's nowhere to get a dang taco. You, you don't make your own taco. Not at 8.30 at night. What? What about at 2 in the morning when you want a taco? No, you don't make no tacos at 2 in the morning. You got a Taco Bell and you get a taco pack for $5 with 88 tacos in it. That's what you do. 
You've never gotten the $5.88 taco pack at 2 in the morning? Dude, that's like the best thing in the world. That's why you go to Taco Bell. 88 taco pack at 2 in the morning, man. See, the 88 taco pack at 2 in the morning is all the tacos they made the day before. That looks like they scooped it out of the kitty litter box. But if you're good with that, put some sauce on it, you're fine, man. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> Listen, there is a thirst within you. A thirst beyond what we can quench here in this world. Any of you guys ever, like, been out on a really hot day? Maybe you were, like, mowing the lawn, or maybe you were jogging, or maybe you were doing, like, practice, any guys that do sports, or, 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 or anything, right? And you're just, like, so thirsty. You ever been, like, so thirsty, like, your, your throat feels cracked and dry? Like, you, you start to feel that dehydration, that, that headache in the back of your head. Like, you, you almost can't even breathe. You start to maybe even feel a little bit nauseous. And then the only thing that can quench that is, like, some nice, cool, water and you get that nice cool water and first of all you just want to pour it all over yourself like be like ah right but but you can't because you're so thirsty so you're like ah and so you drink it as fast as you can and you get that in you and 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 you feel that relief you know what I'm talking about this is what Jesus offers us because we are parched beyond parched and we don't even realize it and he says I will quench your thirst let's go on Continuing John chapter 4, Jesus, okay, so there's this scene of scandal. Jesus is talking to a woman who's a Samaritan at the well, right? All the gossips are starting to gather. They're starting to talk about this. They're being like, who is this Jesus guy? I think he is anyway. What is going on? And in John chapter 4, verse 10, Jesus replied to the woman, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, then you would ask me and I would give you the living water. But sir, she said, you don't have a rope or a bucket and this well is very deep. Where will you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? And Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give them will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I will never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here and get water. Now, this, this lady is kind of mistaken, right, on what Jesus is offering. But she's beginning to do the picture of, of what we need to do as we begin to bring our, 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 our filters and strip our filters away. So the first thing we talk about is this, come to the well. Say, come to the well. The next thing is this, confront the Savior. Say, confront the Savior. So she begins to, to, to have this dialogue with him. She begins to have this conversation, and it begins to go into a deeper level of, of, of talk beyond just the surface of things that, that, that they had started with. And, and what this comes down to for us, you guys, several weeks ago, back in March, we had a series called Engage. Any of you guys remember that series? If you don't remember that series, get online. You can go watch those videos. They're available through uh, our YouTube page, through our Facebook page, through our Vimeo page. You can get on there and find all those messages from our Engage series. But Engage simply was all about this engaging Taking hold and moving forward and doing something beyond just sitting back and watching life pass you by. Two weeks ago, I had the, the opportunity here with you guys to, to wrap up our, 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 um, our Bad Words series. And the bad words we were talking about were submission. And what we talked about that night was that in order to submit, you have to wrestle and you have to contend with God. And this is what we have to do to begin to strip these filters away. We have to come face to face with him. We have to confront the Savior because here's the deal. He knows who you really are and he knows what you really need. So this woman, right, she comes, she thinks she's just thirsty. But what she begins to realize is that she has a thirst that can never be quenched. And Jesus calls her out on that. And he says, you have a thirst that cannot be quenched, but only I can quench it. I can give you water that will never go away. It will become a spring bubbling up within you, a spring that will always quench your thirst. And she's like, dang, give me some of that water right now where you get it. And he's like, oh, oh hold on. It's, it's more than just this. It's more than just me reaching down into the well and scooping out 
a ladle of water. It's more than me just dropping a bucket down and pouring it over you. It is something that happens on the inside when you contend and wrestle and submit. We're going back just a couple weeks ago, right? Because you have to contend, you have to wrestle, you have to submit, you have to confront that Savior. He's the only one who knows who you really are. He's the only one who sees you down to the depths of your core. We try to hide, right? Try to hide who we are. Just like I talked about earlier, we put on these faces, put on these masks, put up these filters so that we show the world what we think they want to see. We show our friends at school what we think they want to see, our people that we work with what we think they want to see, the, the people that we hang out with what we think they want to see, the people online what we think they want to they see. And we, we, we put up all these fronts and all these faces and all these filters to the point where we sometimes can even begin to forget what's real and what's fake. And Jesus says it goes down to deep inside. That chasm, that void, that emptiness that every single human being feels. Every person on earth feels that emptiness, feels that void, feels that chasm, feels that, that sorrow and, and that need for something more. And, and so many people go their entire lives with that emptiness. That thirst that cannot be quenched. And they try to fill it with everything they can. They fill it with money. They fill it with cars. They fill it with relationships. They fill it with sex. They fill it with, with, with everything. They fill it with video games. They fill it with TV. They fill it with Netflix and chill. <laughs> they fill it with anything they possibly can. And they realize that there's nothing that can fill this chasm, fill this void, fill this emptiness within me. Only he knows who you really are, and only he knows what you really need. Only he offers that water that will not run dry. Let's continue on. John chapter 4, beginning in verse 16. We're going to pick right back up. So she just said, please, sir, give me this water. I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here and get water anymore. And Jesus says to her, I love this part, go get your husband, Jesus told her. Now, at this point, I, I don't think Jesus even cares about the social parameters here, right? But social parameters would say, oh, I need to talk to this woman through her husband because a man and a woman do not converse, right? So Jesus says, go and get your husband. So he's like almost putting on the guise of like trying to follow the social norms of the day. And the woman says, I don't have a husband. <laughs> and Jesus says, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five. And the man you're living with now, shacking up with now, sleeping with now, he's not your husband. Dang, Dang is right. He says, you certainly spoke the truth by saying you don't have a husband. So here's a woman, right, who, let's be honest, could be any single human being in this room, anyone that we've met out there, because the circumstances of life are beyond our control. Did you know that? Did you know that the odds are against you in life? We, we, love, we love hearing things like, may the odds be ever in your favor. But I'm going to be the first one to tell you right now, the odds are against you. They just are. In everything in life, the odds are not in your favor. Because life sucks. Life is not fair. It's full of stupid people who make stupid choices and do stupid things. It's full of hurting people who've been hurt and in turn want to hurt others. And so the whole world is full of a whole crap load of crappy people. Amen. Don't you feel just the spirit moving right now? Glory be. <laughs> But here's the thing. None of those crappy people started out that way. And I need you to hear me right now. Those people who are just the worst, 
the ones that you hate, the ones that you despise, the ones that you avoid at all costs, the ones that you subtweet and they subtweet you all day long, those ones that you don't want anything to do with, they didn't start out that way. Because every single one of us started out as a pure and amazing creation of the divine creator made with a purpose to do something amazing and leave a lasting impact in this world. But the problem is too many people came along and said, no, you can't. No, you don't. No, you won't. You are stupid. You are ugly. You are dumb. You are this and you are that and you aren't this and you aren't that and you can't this and you can't that. And before you know it, you start to believe those words. You hear it long enough. You see it long enough. Enough of life comes against you. Enough of those odds roll over you. Enough of all the unfairness of everything and every day that you face just mows you down and beats you down and stomps you down. And you start to just stay down. Because what's the point in getting up? Heard some heartbreaking news this week. There was a guy who used to go to our church here. I'm not going to say his name because you might know him, but I'm just going to say this. When I met him, he was young and strong and newly married. I was at his wedding. The guy was just amazing, just an incredible guy. Really, really cool guy. Amazing wife. As they were going through their marriage, they had two amazing kids. But then life just started to happen. And he forgot who he was, and he began to believe what other people said. And next thing you knew, things fell apart in his marriage. His wife moved away. She divorced him. He found himself alone here. I actually haven't heard a word about him since that happened about five years ago. And then this week... Someone who I'm still friends with here at the church who was also friends with him and his wife ran into him out in Old Henderson. And she said it broke her heart. And all she could do was just weep for him. Because here this guy who was young and strong and vibrant and full of joy and hope and starting this incredible new life with his new wife and everything else, when she encountered him this week, she said, I could barely recognize him. She said, I knew it was him, and I walked up and talked to him, and he recognized me. She said he looked homeless. He smelled homeless. He was with another woman who she said, by all intents and purposes, looked like she was strung out on crack. She was holding a folded up cardboard sign. She said that she walked away from that and just wept and wept and wept. See, we look at this story, we listen to this, and we hear about this woman, and, and it's easy for us to judge, right? And to think, oh, Jesus is getting her. He's, yeah, he's getting her. Because he's like, you're right. You're right in saying that you're not married. You're right in saying that you don't have a husband because you've had five and the man you're with is not your husband. But the way that we have to understand how Jesus is communicating this and some of the things that we lose in the original translations of the old languages here is that Jesus is not doing this out of judgment. Jesus is not doing this out of condemnation and guilt. Jesus is simply doing this as a matter of fact. Because he understands that sometimes life happens. And that every single one of us is two bad choices away from the street, away from a life of death and destruction and poverty and hopelessness. Every one of us is two bad choices away from a life of pain and hardship. 
And here's this woman. So we're learning how do we strip away these filters? Well, we've got to come to the well. Here we are. We've got to confront the Savior. He knows who you really are. You got to confess to the king. Hashtag no filter. Because the fact is this, nothing is hidden from him. The deepest, darkest places in your life, those things that you have thought about and seen, that you've watched or talked about, the words that you have used, that you hope that nobody ever finds out about. He knows. He's seen them. And he doesn't just love you in spite of those things. He loves you because of those things, because he loves you. And this is what we need to understand more than anything, is that he is love. This is evident throughout the word. He is love. He is love. He is love. He is not judgment. He is not condemnation. The word tells us there is therefore now no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus. But too often we hear about judgment. We hear about condemnation. We hear about all these things. And we forget about love. And we forget about the fact that he knows us better than we know ourselves. This is, (laughs) listen, you look around. Look around this room right now. Look at every guy, every girl. Y'all are walking around with a never-ending filter putting on a face, putting on a show, pretending you're something you're not, pretending to be something, pretending not to be something that you are. But he knows your name. He knows who you are. He knows you better than you know yourself, down to the point that he knows the number of hairs on your head. You don't even know that. I doubt any one of you in this room, I don't care how vain you are, has sat in the mirror and been like, One, two, three, four, 5,488, 22,949. Oh, I lost count again. Guess I got to start over. Good thing I'm good looking. One. (laughs) You don't even know that, and he knows that. He knows everything about you. He knows your deepest, darkest thoughts. He knows about that one time you thought about just like killing that person. You know what I'm talking about. You were like, I just want to kill him right now. Everyone in this room is like, yeah, that person. I know who you're talking about, Pastor Steve, because I still want to kill him. What is wrong with you? You guys are psycho. You got problems. Listen, our office is open for counseling, right, Pastor Jason? We got counseling available for those of you that feel like killing people on any regular basis. Pastor Jason is available for what is called physical response therapy. We'll give you a stick, and you can just hit him until you feel better. Oh, you didn't know we were opening that up. (laughs) How much? Uh, It's it's like two bucks a session. It's pretty awesome. It all goes to speed the light. (laughs) Two bucks a session. It all goes to speed the light. It's pretty awesome. Listen, he knows you. He knows you. And he loves you. You are loved more than you can ever begin to imagine. Loved more than you can ever begin to even wrap your head around. You are loved. Let's wrap this up. John chapter 4, beginning of verse 19. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me why it is that the Jews insist Jerusalem is the only place to worship while Samaritans claim it is here where our ancestors worship. Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will not matter where you worship, on this mountain or in Jerusalem. For you Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him. For salvation is through what was revealed to the Jews. But the time is coming indeed, it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is looking for those who will worship him in that way. God is spirit. And so those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. 
And I want you to understand that the word he uses right there for I am is the same word that God revealed to Moses that his name was I am that I am. I am the eternal God. I am the one who is never ending. I am the beginning. I am the middle. I am the end. He says I am the Messiah. And in your Bible, in case you don't believe me, that's why that is capitalized. He says I am. And just then his disciples came walking back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman. (gasps) Jesus, what are you doing? (laughs) I love these guys. Jesus. Jesus Christ. He's like, yes, that's my name. Um. (laughs) And they're like, what are you doing? He's like, just having a conversation, fellas. It's okay. Why are you talking to her? What do you want with her? Right? These guys are freaking out now. The woman leaves her water jar beside the well and runs back to the village, telling everyone. She says, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Now, here's the crazy thing about this. She's not 100% fully convinced yet, just like I would wager to say many of you in this room are not 100% fully convinced yet that this thing is real, that this thing is true, that there really is a Jesus who loves you more than anything. And she says this, could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people come streaming from the village to see him. And it says this, many of the Samaritans from the village Believed in Jesus because the woman said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed there another two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. And then they said to the woman, now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because of what we have heard ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. All right, so you got to come to the well. You got to go to that place where you know that your need can be met you got to confront the Savior. you got to confess to the king because he knows who you are. And then finally, you got to compel the village to come with you. You have to tell others about what you have seen. See, this is the thing. When, when you meet him face to face, when you realize who he is and what he has for you, when all your filters are stripped away and all that is left is you, and he says, There you are. There you are. Take all that off. Pull all that down. Lay it all aside. There you are. I love you. You. Not the you with that filter. Not the you with that guise. Not the you with 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 that persona. I love you. There you are. I was looking for you. I was wondering where you were all this time. There you are. I love you. And when you come to the well and drink the water, when you confront the Savior, when you confess to the King, you cannot help but compel your village to come to. Whatever your village is, maybe it's your friends at school, maybe it's your family at home, maybe it's your brothers and sisters, your stepbrothers, your stepsisters, maybe it's your foster parents. Whoever it is, whoever your village is, you cannot help but compel them to come to and tell others about what you have found and what He has done for you because you found the one thing that everyone is looking for. For the only one who can fulfill the emptiness in every human being. When you find that, you cannot help but bring your village along too and everyone else you meet. Will you pray with me? Everyone in this room, as we wrap up our time, I simply want to ask this. Have you come to the well? And is it time? Time to drink, time to fulfill that emptiness, that need that every human being has. Are you ready to come to the well? No filters, no masks, no hiding, just you. So that Jesus can look down and see you and say, there you are. There you are. I love you. If you're ready to come to the well, will you just raise your hand? And put it back down. Don't worry about anybody else. And will you say these words with me? Say, Jesus. Jesus. 
I know I've put on a mask. I know I've put up filters. I've pretended to be what I'm not. And I've pretended not to be what I am. Sometimes I even forget who I am. But Jesus, I ask that you would remind me who I am, who you made me to be, and who I could be in you. I need your water. I'm thirsty. I'm empty. And only you can help me. So give me your water and fill my emptiness so that I will not thirst again. Let me know you in a real way. And let me know your love. That you love me just as I am. All of my brokenness. All of my darkness. All of my filters. But let me lay all that down. To just be me. For you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Will you guys stand up with me?